Welcome to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. We interview great guests who inspire you to overcome obstacles and achieve your goals. Be sure you visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now, just relax as you listen. You can do something else, but be ready to make an important note. And let's get started. The title of this interview is Aim Higher, Elevate Your Life. And the guest is life coach Michael Cohan. The things Hi, how are you doing? Hey, Michael, thank you so much for joining me and coming on. The things we're going to be talking about with Michael are the difference between habits and goals and how they shape our lives, focusing on both the dark and the light, how they, uh, within uh, a holistic approach to personal success, toxic self-help versus life's journey of self-discovery and growth. And I'm, that's one I really want to get into because I don't know if you know, Michael, I've created a virtual coaching program, which is going to transform self-help and I claim usher in a success revolution. So I, I think that will be a meaty conversation. Uh, and I'm sure all of it will. Uh, we'll be talking about how to ignore the weapons of mass distract, distraction to learn to live your life on purpose. Boy, if that's not a relevant topic, I don't know what is. Uh, <laughs> intentional laziness that leads to success. That's going to be a good one. Uh, that Everyone should just tune in just for that one alone how to build a successful coaching business, what it means to be stuck in the moment of genius, spiritual toxicity, focusing only on the light and, and ignoring the dark. And we'll, we'll be, and I'll be asking the questions and Michael will be answering them. What can Eastern philosophy teach us about living successfully in the modern world? By the way, I love that, Michael. I, I, uh, I study and strive to practice Zen and Buddhism and Confucianism. Right now I'm studying Marcus Aurelius, not the, not the Far East, but uh, ancient Rome uh, with a protege. We're creating a course from the meditation. So I'm really getting into the Eastern philosophies much more. Than, there's a lot of practicality there, a lot of practicality uh, for our modern day. People may think, oh, no, you got to listen to Tony Robbins. Tony Robbins is great, but uh, so is Marcus Aurelius and C Confucian and all that stuff. Uh, we'll be talking about, um, well, I'll be asking Michael, uh, what is success? How can mindfulness help one live a better life? How do we suffer and how we can heal suffering through non-attachment? Boy, that's some Buddhist stuff right there. How does a person live life with integrity? What is a holistic wellness? And how can practicing it deconstruct negative patterns? Why are change and personal growth difficult? And why do most people fall, fail in achieving their dreams and goals? Totally. And that's why I created Proficio, that virtual coaching program, by the way. Uh, we'll get into that. How do you go from a corporate job to building a health and wellness business from scratch with no initial investment? So this is going to be a meaty, very valuable conversation especially if you want to become a coach and go into that into that change work field the coaching field but even if you just want to improve your life this is the conversation for you thank you so much for joining me michael but let me tell you about michael's background real quick first you know he's not just some schlub off the street like me he's actually for he's actually got an icf certification which i never bothered to get <laughs> when i when i was a life coach Michael Cohan is an ICF, that's International uh, Coaching Federation, certified life coach who wakes up each morning with a, with a simple purpose, to help others rediscover their powerful inner strengths and give clients and students the tools they need to make more meaningful decisions, to aim higher and elevate their life. Those are caps, by the way, we'll get into that. In 2015, he founded the Elevate Life Project an online community for people to rediscover their true selves and gain the skills they need to move forward and find lasting success. He is the host of the Elevate Life Project podcast, a show dedicated to helping listeners develop a positive mindset, a rejuvenated outlook for themselves and their future, rediscovering what they that they are spiritual beings, even if you don't realize it, you are, <laughs> and any dream a person 
wants in life is possible. Absolutely. Michael is dedicated to helping his clients and students find balance in all aspects of their lives, emotional, spiritual, mental, and physical well-being. He feels his purpose is to serve others through his teaching by encouraging students and clients to become steadfast in their practices while integrating spiritual and mindful living into their day-to-day -day lives to achieve their goals, to live their dreams, and achieve the impossible. Michael, you're my kind, my kind of guy. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks. I mean, it's humbling hearing all that. And when you listen to someone read your bio and talk about the questions that you're going to talk about, it can become very overwhelming because you're like, wow, these are some you, heavy you topics. You better deliver, my friend. You <laughs> promised me. <laughs> they're, they're, they're important topics in today's age. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, I don't, I don't need to repeat myself, but the stuff that you're talking about, this, I mean, yeah, here we are in 2022, but you can go back as far as you want. And the human condition has, has always been the same. We're always going to have obstacles and pressures that get in the way of what we want. So what are we going to do? That's, that's, you know, I always, I say, to, I say to myself and I tell others, life is always asking one question and only one question. And that is, what are you going to do constantly and perpetually? <laughs> So I'm going to ask you uh, my first question. What can Eastern philosophy teach us about living successfully in the modern world? Well, I, I think we're at a really interesting period in time. You know, if we look back on the history, the average person in this world is wealthier than any person 100 years ago simply by just having a cell phone and access to the internet, you have more knowledge, entertainment and communication than you ever had. So we are very overwhelmed right now with information and we as people do not know how to discern it. Pretty much everything that we talk about to today on this podcast, when it comes to psychology and coaching, 90% of it comes from two seminal texts, specifically the Bhagavad Gita and the Diamond Sutras. And the Bhagavad Gita is a Hindu text, which is pretty much 700 verses. That's part of a larger poem called the Mahabharata. The Bhagavad Gita was the inspiration of Thoreau the inspiration of Freud and Carl Jung. And it's the science of how to live a successful life. It's an understanding that although you want to have goals and you want to pursue success, when you become attached to that victory, the fruits of your labor, you become toxic. And then you begin to become a toxic individual who makes poor decisions. When we look at Eastern philosophy, it's about living humbly, which is a form of self-criticism. It's about being mindful, living below your financial means. It's about having a purpose of what I do today, how will this affect future me and how will this affect the future world that I will inherit. Those core principles allow us to then make decisions that are positive, that have an impact on us to create a better life. What I mean by that is this, right? And I can only speak in the terms of being an American because in America, we have great things. Like we're, we're a society that's built on individualism, so we have this belief that anybody can achieve their goals and be successful. But because we're a society of individuals, we don't have a lot of safety nets, retirement. We don't have that in America. Other countries do have that we do not. When we live with this idea of non-attachment or we live this idea of being simple, we can then ask ourselves this question for, that I think a lot of people struggle with is, do I need to buy that really expensive thing that will give me a short-term reward today versus can I live 
humbly for the future that will require, that will give me a better quality of life. And that's pretty much what Eastern philosophy will teach you. Coincidentally, I mentioned my my app, Proficio, which will launch imminently, which I claim is going to transform self-help. The first course, which is The Way the Wealth by Benjamin Franklin, adapted for the modern audience. And then, and then we're going to get every self-help course in the world in there. Uh, that's my goal. Uh, but we got to start somewhere. So we, we adapted this. Uh, and of course, Franklin espouse that the most valuable thing that we have is time, uh, more or less. Uh, I mean, basically. But one of the major tenets that he teaches and professes is to le live exactly like you described, uh, humbly, without pride, without vanity, within your means. And and if you do that, you will have, well, and it will, that will be a major component of having a quote unquote successful life, a life of happiness, a life that is not uh, dysfunctional, uh, a life that that works, that is logical and works as opposed to chaotic and roller coaster. Well, I mean, like, what's this keep it? Let's, let's look at this one thing. What, like, we, what is the one absolute truth in this world? There's only that one real truth in this world that we will die. We're going to die. But we all live by this idea that it's not going to happen to us. It's one of the greatest illusions. If we knew we were going to die and we were going to leave this physical body and, and move on to another form of consciousness, would we live the way we live? No. And so because we have this attachment to the life that we are living within this body we then cling to the things that we can grasp and because we cling to those things that we can grasp we become what is called we form an ego that ego is this belief then that gets created that i am either better or worse than the people around me and so i begin to compare myself to others and by comparing myself to others if someone is better than me, I try to tear them down. If someone is worse than me, I try to step onto their shoulders. And when we do that, then we become at odds with our true nature, which is compassion, love, and spirituality. And that is the big suffering that we have, which is why then we cling to all these things that we're unable to change. It's this idea that we like, it's always this idea, like somehow 20 years ago, the world was better than it is today. Somehow my life was better at a different point in, in time. And your life is always in flux. Your life is always going to change. The world was never better 20 years ago. The world was never better five years ago. The same challenges that you have today are the same challenges you had five years ago. It's letting go of that, trying to cling to this physical reality that doesn't allow us to be spiritual in, instead of being material. Absolutely. I rambled can, a little bit there, though. Uh, quite on, my man. And you can always tell when you're operating from this ego, uh, well, there's a number of ways, but not the least of which is if you're attacking or defending, that's where you are. You're operating from the ego. Without, if, you're not, if you're not attacking or defending, great. Now you can go to somewhere else, but that's, that's always a telltale sign of the ego. Right. Like you want to, it's like, there's nothing wrong with being successful. Like there's nothing wrong with wanting to drive a nice car. There's nothing wrong with wanting to live in a nice house, but if that's what defines you and that's what gives you a sense of self-worth, then you have to either constantly defend it or you constantly have to fight for it. Right. And that's going to lead to this a toxic life. If you wake up in the morning, and this goes back to Eastern philosophy, if you wake up in the morning with the idea that I'm a spirit being, I'm a child of God or source or divinity, and I'm going to do my best to leave the world better than I was given it, and I'm going to do my best to make the world better, then success will come regardless if you just focus on that. But what happens is everybody focuses on these YouTube videos, Instagram, got to get the Lambo, got to get the private jet, I got to be on the stage, motivational speaking, I got to be this big success. I get to sit up, wake up every morning and coach and shorts and a t-shirt. 
from my house. I don't have to commute. I don't have to go anywhere. And you know why I'm able to do that? Because I don't live above my means. That's right. That's a critical right? thing. A, I don't. You're not, it, right. You're not I, struggling to pay the bills because you know. No. You're not. You're you're living very rationally. And here's the thing: I didn't always make a lot of money. There was a point when I started this coaching business where I was living off of fifteen hundred dollars a month. A month. Yeah. That includes rent, car insurance, car payments, health insurance groceries, electric bill, cable bill, and putting every dollar into building my coaching business, which means I basically had $50 a week for like incidentals. It's like when you sit there and you go and you have this idea of like, if I don't live this glamorous, fabulous life, then there's something wrong with me. Instead of living a great life that is reasonable for you. And everybody keeps trying to reach for like, I got to be this billionaire, millionaire, mega rich guy, or I'm a failure. And that's just not important in life. I, I used to, when I was, when I was studying spirituality, I used to volunteer at the hospitals every once in a while. And I used to do end of life services with people. No one ever came up to me and said, I wish I had more money. No one ever came up to me and said, I wish I worked more. No one ever came up to me and said, I wish I saved more. Everybody always says, I wish I lived more, loved more, traveled more, and did more to make the world better. No one ever said the other. But yet we seem to be obsessed with that. And also took more risk. That's a very common regret. Took more risk. Agreed on that one too. Right. Yes. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor. And, and Michael just spoke about all these pursuits that's so common, um, ubiquitous. Now we're going to get some clarity. He's going to answer the question, what is success? When we come right back with Michael Cohen. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Proficio. Do you like learning by yourself or with others? What if you could do both at the same time? Visit www.proficio.io. That's proficio.io, where you can learn in the environment that suits you as you choose. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having a very valuable, I think very valuable, conversation with Michael Cohen. He talked about all about, he described modern life, especially in this internet age, the social media age, about all the things that we want and pursue. So, Michael What's your definition of success? What is success? To me, success is really quite simple. That you are doing the best that you can in the field that you're trying to pursue professionally without sacrificing your mental well-being, your physical well-being, your emotional well-being, your relationship with your family, your friends, and your partner, and without destroying the relationships you have with your community and your colleagues. That's the true definition of success. What we have this idea in culture is if I'm doing something, whether it's building a coaching business or starting a career in a particular industry, if I'm not at the seat of the table within six months, something's wrong and I'm a failure. We have to become patient in our endeavors for success. And we have to remember to not sacrifice the things I just mentioned. Yes. That any success that we want to have in life takes 10 years. It's just a fact. It's a fact. It took me 10 years to be an overnight success. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I, I'm an actor, though. I haven't done anything in a while. And uh, the, the very guy who became my mentor, and I never even thought about having a mentor, who also introduced neuro-linguistic programming to me in, in the area of acting, too. I never even heard of it. And, and that's, a, that's a pretty rare thing. But it's very, it's basically, it's totally applicable. Anyway, he said, about he would talk about, this guy is, was George Morrison, by the way. He was the guy behind Gene Hackman. Dustin mm-hmm. Hoffman, I mean, the guy, the first guy that, that they mentioned. And he turned me on to NLP, which blew me away and became my mentor. And he and I and he, we would talk about the great actors, of course. And he would say, what does it take? 10 years. Just same thing that you said. Period. It takes 10 years. So you, you're, if, you're, if you're saying the same thing that George Morrison said, you know something. And I only can speak, once again, for America. Like in America, if you want to be successful, 
It takes 10 years to get there. But you have to make sure that you, in those 10 years, you're not sacrificing things that I mentioned. You're not putting your life in jeopardy. You're not putting your family in jeopardy. You're not putting your health in jeopardy. You're not putting your friends or your family or your relationship or your community at harm. But at the same time, we have to realize that it's going to take 10 years. But if you wake up every morning and you work really hard and you live below your financial means, you will eventually become a success. But what happens, and I can speak specifically for coaching, when I see a lot of coaches, because the average, what does the average life coach make? The, according to the last time I checked the statistics, the average life coach makes $7,000 a year. Oh, I That's thought it was 10000 I thought it was 10000 It's down to seven. <laughs> it's seven. It's seven now. I make, you know, 10, 15, 20 X that. But it's because I never gave up. I didn't sit there and go every month, every year. I kept plugging away, trying to get the business going. I started off with one idea. It failed. I pivoted. Started another idea. It failed. I pivoted. Eventually, I came up with the name of my company after four different renditions. Eventually, I came up with my tagline after six different renditions. Till finally, after 10 years, became enough that it could support me full time. What happens with a lot of people, it's like, I have this dream, I have this idea, I do it for six months, it doesn't go anywhere, I give up, I'm done. And then I let, let me put it down. Let me compliment on that for a moment, Michael. Sure. You know, of course, you're absolutely correct, obviously. But, uh, you know, I, right now, like I said, I, I have this company, you know, I was a life coach, now I have Auxilium, I'm the, I'm the executive director. It's a technological coaching company. And we've created this virtual coaching program. All right. Uh, there was four years of, of pre-development. We formed the company with my partner. Uh, and there's been four years of development. We we're a tech company. We've been undercapitalized. Still haven't launched. This has been quite, I'm an ex-paratrooper. I'm a recovered drug addict. I've been homeless in Los Angeles. You know, I, quite frankly, this is, and I've, I've been an entrepreneur for much of my life. This is the most difficult thing I've ever done. I haven't even launched yet. I know that as long as I haven't given up, of course, the other side of pers persistence is the key to success, but the other side of that is learning. You got to you gotta learn. You can't- You got to learn to grow. You got can't repeat the same mistakes. You got to be effective. I know that, and let me tell you, not, this is that if I quit, then it's over and not until then. This has been so difficult and I have become too attached as you talked about, because I've had a few thoughts of suicide which I quickly left away. Uh, you know, I, I was suicidal in the 90s. I've grown, but blah, 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 blah. You know, I've had that thought because it's been so difficult. But I also realized when I had that moment, those, those thoughts, I'm too attached to that outcome. I just need to be in the present, in the moment. Uh, and, I, and I know that as long as I keep at it, I'll get to that launch and then I can work on the other important things, right. you know, cause it's kind of nice to have a customer in a business. It's a kind of nice thing. We haven't even got there yet, but I know that I'm going to stick with it and I'm going to make it happen because it takes a lot to be a success. You don't going to get it. You're not going to get it quick just cause it's a great idea. Like what I got, or you're good at it. You got to stick with it. You talked about 10 years. I agree with you. 10 years. Go on. Well, what's the difference between someone who makes $10,000 and a hundred thousand dollars? $90,000. <laughs> Hard work. What's the difference between someone who makes $100,000 and a million dollars? $900,000. Okay. Right, right, okay. Like, so hard work in the initial part, look more on the, on the, the right, part. Right. Like what's the difference of what we can go with acting? Like if you want it, like acting is another field or any field. If you want to be a working, a professional actor, because I had friends, I lived in New York City for 17 years. I had friends that were working actors, meaning that's what they did for a living. They made between 70 and 150 thousand dollars a year acting. They did every acting job under the sun. Whenever you, they were in six plays, they were they acted at the universities. They did acting classes. They worked hard and they hustled and they made a decent living from 100. $150,000 a year to a million dollars a year as an actor. After that, it's just luck. It's just like, it's just, there's, it's in your cards. It's karma. What's the difference between a life coach who makes a hundred to $200,000 a year and a life coach that makes a million dollars a year? It's your karma. 
It's this, you you have that certain, some people have that level of luck. You know, I've, ne- I've never luck. thought about it, you know, in that way. And now that I have, now that you said that, I completely right. agree with you. <laughs> I completely, if, completely agree with you. But like a hundred, you know, like, and, and like for those listeners living in other parts of the world, $150,000 to them is a million dollars to us, right? But if you make a hundred, $150,000 a year, that's enough money in America to live a good life and save for retirement, drive a decent car, live in a decent neighborhood, have a nice house and be able to go on a couple a vacation or two a year. What more do you need in this world? The problem is everybody keeps trying to get that more and more and more and more and more. So if they're not getting that luck, some, they think they're failing. They always think they're failing. It goes to, it's to the same concept of people who have problems in this world, where for some reason, because of all this social media, and this is the weapons of mass distraction we were going to talk about, social media, television, reality TV, all these things that are telling you, if you're not living this glamorous life, if you're not wearing the most expensive clothes and going out to these awesome restaurants, if you don't, if you, if you have any sort of problems in your marriage or you have anxiety or depression, or you have some sort of disability, that if you have anything wrong with you, you're a failure. And that's not true. And that's not reality. It's, we have to understand that we all have the things that we're constantly working on that when you get to a certain point in life, you have to say, this is great. I make enough. I live enough. Everything else after that is just gravy. And I don't need to worry about the rest. Now let go of it all. Letting go is a critical thing. Great yeah. stuff, Michael. Uh, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor and we'll come right back and we'll get on with this, the rest of this fantastic conversation. I'm loving it. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Proficio. The pandemic has painfully shown how we must have money put away, not just for a rainy day, but for a whole bunch of them. You must accrue wealth to really be okay. Visit www.proficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can truly learn financial principles like never before so that you can have the future you really want and need. You are listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having an awesome conversation with Michael Cohen. He, we just talked about success. And uh, of course, Michael and I are both coaches. Uh, but one thing I often, you know, when I when I, keep, I had a client, they they, they, want, they pursue goals. Nine, the vast majority of what I did is I help clients pursue goals. Um, and uh, and they like, oh yeah, when I when I get this, I'll be happy. I'm like, well, that's your first mistake, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. And of course, the cliche is it's in the journey. Guess what? It's a very true cliche. <laughs> it's a very true cliche, people. It is in the journey. The thing is, I mean, yeah, you know, cliches are, are cliches, but it's not the goal that's going to make you happy. You you think it will, uh, but you'll find out what it makes you feel like when you get there. But the trick that you got to get is get happy now. That's the trick. <laughs> that's the game. That's the deal. Because just as Michael was really elaborated on, you know, we're, we're, we're in a very terminal situation here. Uh, and it's wonderful. It's quite wonderful. It's divine. Uh, and uh, life's not going to wait for you to get happy. You, you need to get happy now. That's that's the deal. Yeah, I have, I have, I, I, I have challenges with some of that because that goes okay, to great. sort of like what I taught. Like, I think one of the things that is on my talking list, like toxic self help, or commonly known as toxic pos- po- positivity, right? That we have to be happy all the time. And well, I, I didn't this- say all the time. I didn't say all the time. I'm I saying know, forget about. I know the- you did it. <laughs> I I'm know saying, you did. I'm saying I, I, it's not the thing that's going to get you happy. It's your job to get you happy now. That's what I'm saying. Well, I, I I don't think that should be the goal. I think it's an I think it sells books. I think it's I think the goal in life is fulfillment. Fulfillment yes, I is the is the goal. Happiness is an emotion. We have but we this goes back to what we were talking about before the break. 
the you know weapons of mass distraction and that if you have a problem or something's wrong with you you know any sort of problem that you're going through that it's something to overcome i look at problems as opportunities for growth not something to overcome so what i mean by this and and i'm going to bring it all back together to the idea of happiness okay so just bear with me Go what i mean sir. so the foundation is this and this is we have both the light and the dark. We have day and night. So let's understand that as our foundational principle. What I mean by that is in our life, we have two pieces of paper. We have on these two pieces of paper that we carry with us. On one hand is a piece of paper listing everything that we like about our lives, who we are as a person, how we look at ourselves in the mirror, our family, our friends, our relationship, our career, our entire story of all these things that we like. But then at the same time on this other list, we have another piece of paper that says everything wrong with me in my life. And we have a list of personality flaws, learning disabilities, problems with our relationships, our careers and our struggles. We think this list of things that we don't like about our lives as a problem that is something that we need to overcome or discard. We don't grow in this world and in life unless we have the problems and the challenges. That's why we're here. That's why we're born into this body. Because if we live in this perfect world of bliss, happiness, and heaven, we don't change. Because why would you ever want to change if everything's perfect? So we first have to look at all the things that we don't like about our lives not as problems, but as opportunities for growth. Yes. And so when we look at that as an opportunity for growth, what does that do for us psychologically? It shifts our mindset from something that we can't deal with to something that we can learn to grow from and be evolved and become a better version of ourselves. Absolutely. Okay. Now we got that foundation. Then we go to the idea of the weapons of mass distraction, right? The idea that when we were watching TV, we're looking on social media, we're watching, we're we're seeing the news. We we have two messages that are constantly bombarded with us. Message one: the world is ending. That anybody that doesn't believe that what you believe in. Every, anybody that doesn't have your belief philosophy yeah. is the enemy destroying the fabrics of society right. and the world is ending. Yeah, this nonsense. And then that's the one message. And then the other message is if you don't live this glamorous life and you don't have the fanciest car and the best restaurants and the greatest kids and the best of everything, you're a failure. So the world's ending and you're a failure. Right. And get so materialistic, left- get vain, because it's not just going to end for you. It's going to end for the whole world. There'll be no prodigy. It's ridiculous. Right. And so we have those two bombarding messages. And so then we go into this world of personal growth. And you're like, you know, like, I got to fix some things in my life, whether it's I got financial problems or I got relationship problems, or I just have like some ailments, whether it's anxiety, depression read a bunch of books, go to some yoga classes. I see this a lot in yoga, right? It's this idea that the goal is to be happy. The goal is to be blissful. The goal is to find peace. Right. You know, and when you, I I didn't want to uh, suggest that happiness is a goal. I'm suggesting that happiness is not going to be found in the future. Happiness, it can it's be found. never it's going to be found. It, right. It's going to be, it can be experienced now. Uh, Correct. And that, and that comes from uh, gratitude. It comes from understanding. It comes from acceptance. But, you know, I, I uh, like I mentioned, I, I was a life coach. I don't work one-on-one with anyone anymore. I'm just striving to launch this, this uh, coaching program. But my nephew came to me recently. Uh, he's depressed. He's, a, he's an addict. So, of course, I'm going to help him, obviously. I mean, even if I wasn't a coach or or a recover, you know, a person with a lot of recovery. And uh, he was very depressed, suicidal. Uh, And uh, and, uh, and one of the things, a major thing I spoke with him about, now I'm continuing to, I work with him daily now, 
is having a purpose, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and just by wonderful coincidence, and Michael at the end of this uh, conversation is going to offer our audience a free gift. But I saw what you were about, Michael, uh, and uh, and I was looking at you know our email uh, well, that you have with my podcast manager, and I saw that you really know what you're doing. So I just sent him by email your link about finding your purpose, oh, cool. <laughs> because that is a critical thing, my friends. You got to know what your purpose is so that you can get congruent with it, because then you'll get away from depression and sadness, and you'll start knowing what fulfillment is. You'll know what, what you'll be driven because that's what makes life worth it when you got something that's why you're here that's what you need that's that's when that that's when you get into happiness that's when you get into having sadness and depression in your rear view mirror and not not touching you not that we can't be sad and depressed even when we when doing things right things are circumstantial but we get back low we get some equanimity we even we get our keel even and say hey wait a second Life, yeah, this sucked, that sucked, but life's really not that bad. And what's my purpose? Am I working towards it? Well, yeah, because it's this understanding. And that's what I was, uh, I wanted to finish up is like our emotions, happiness, sadness, depression, those are experience. Those are allowing us to experience what is happening at this moment. If we are, sometimes in life, we are depressed and sometimes we have serious cases of depression. Yeah. Sometimes we have, there are individuals who have severe chemical imbalances where they're unable to produce certain uh, hormonal hormones that allow them to not experience depression to the excessive degree. But we also have to understand for the by and large, for the most of us, our emotions are what we do. They're not who we are, right? We do happiness. We aren't happy. We do sad. We aren't sad. And so when we try to reach that state of happiness, we're already there if we want to be. Now, remember, there are outliers to that conversation. There are people who are going through some severe challenges in life, whether it's divorce or death in the family or they have some serious chemical imbalances where they may not be able to experience those emotions of happiness or joy or excitement. So we have to acknowledge them, but we also have to understand that those are the outliers. There's nothing wrong with it, but the majority of us can understand that if we let go and we're not attached to those, what we're experiencing once again, we can experience experience those emotions that we're seeking in any circumstance. When we're able to see both the good and bad in everything, that is when we're able to move forward. What I, what I, and I can use an example in my life. If I did not get married and divorced within six months when I was 29 years old, I would have never have gone into a personal mental meltdown where I got addicted to drugs and alcohol. That would never led me to have a, uh, an inter my, my friends having an intervention saying that I needed to seek help, which would never led me to see my therapist who would never have prescribed yoga as a way for me to cope with the challenges that I was going to, which would never led me to start studying yoga, to become a yoga teacher, to meet my spiritual mentor, to meet my, my guru, which would never have led me to becoming a life coach, which would never have led me to meet my wife that I have today. It's, wonderful. it's when we're able to look at both the bad and the good with value is when we are no longer trying to find happiness, we're able to experience it. Absolutely. And, you know, just, just recently, uh, while I studied the meditations, I, I never bought into providence you know and this notion that everything happens for a reason i would say okay well yeah uh, everything happens for a reason quite often a stupid reason but i've really i've left that 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 belief i'm really i'm really subscribing to providence now just as you described uh you know it's everything you know if you can get if you get bent about something or negative if you can understand or believe uh that it happens so that the better thing can happen you can start letting go of those negative feelings and be open to the possibilities of today. And that could be a game changer per se for a person. 
Uh, and you just described a wonderful journey, and I could say the same journey, and so could any person if they right. looked at the positive side, not to discount the negative parts of life, because you know it's a life is a yin yang situation, man. <laughs> it's to see both the same value in mud as in gold. <laughs> right. Great stuff. Let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor. I'm going to come back with the great Michael Cohen. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. What if you could get the results of being coached without a human coach? What if a computer could coach you? Visit www.perficio.io. That's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can get coached without scrutiny, judgment, or pressure. You are listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. We're having a fantastic conversation with Michael Cohen. At the outset, I talked about some of the questions that I would ask Michael. And certainly I did some, I articulated some deliberately, but we've talked about so much stuff. There's been so much enmeshment here. So we actually got into mindfulness and we got into suffering. But if... I mean, do you want to elaborate a little bit more on mindfulness right now? Uh, I mean, I, I, I'm very, yeah. often, very often, I'm like, I have to ask myself, I, I ask myself, what am I doing? Because I don't know, I get so <laughs> trance, like, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. I have to say, what am I doing? What am I doing? Well, how can mindfulness help one live a better life, Michael? Well, I, I think what's this give us, I like to give this simple definition of mindfulness. Mindfulness is just an understanding that your thoughts and emotions affect your environment and or your environment affects your thoughts and emotions. Yes. So that gives you the tools to be able to control your circumstances. So we'll go back to the idea of happiness. If you're unhappy in your life, what mindfulness will ask you is, are you unhappy because of your environment, where you're living, where you're working, or are you unhappy because how you're thinking and feeling? When you are able to understand where the root is to the suffering that you are experiencing, then you can begin to take action to change it. Plenty of people right now with my with, with mindfulness coaching, I a lot of my clients are experiencing loneliness at a record high. This is so for those of you who want to be a life coach or get into the coaching business. Now is the time because there is an epidemic of mental wellness in America right now. And we don't have, a, there's not enough therapists. Mental unwellness. Yes, mental unwellness. And there's not enough therapists and psychiatrists to go around. So if you, if you want to start a coaching business, now's the time. But pivoting back, a lot of my clients are experiencing loneliness right now. And my will also ask the question of why do you feel lonely? And most of my clients will give the simple answer of, I feel isolated. I'm alone. I, you know, I don't see anybody anymore. I work from home or I just, I go into the office and half my office is empty and I just feel disconnected. And so then what, with mindfulness, what I'll do is we'll be like, well, then let's change the environment. Let's have you either work in, in an office share space around other people or believe it or not, something I'm, I was shocked that I started prescribing, let's have you go to the mall a couple of days a week and just walk around the mall. And believe it or not, getting people out of the house and going for a walk on the mall has helped a lot of people cure their loneliness. I was shocked at how we used to like prescribe, don't go to the mall. And now with mindfulness, we're saying go to the mall. That's what I was spurking about. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. But that's the basic understanding of it. It's either your environment, it's either your thoughts, or it's your emotions. And you want to understand what one is causing the imbalance. Absolutely. So to be able to discern, that's a critical thing. So all right, let me ask my next question. All right, we're talking about suffering. We talk, you alluded to this earlier. Uh, why do we suffer and how can we heal suffering through non-attachment? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So there's a Sanskrit saying, Abhyasa Vyagyak Yam Tam Narodaha. Through the attach through the practice of non-attachment, one obtains the perfection of yoga, Eastern philosophy. What does that mean for the average listener? It means that when you practice not being attached, 
you no longer suffer. Well, well then how do I, how, what, what, what do you mean? I have a job, I have kids, I have a wife. I'm attached to the things that I have in my life. Okay, great. You need to, you want to have attachments because attachments allow for intimacy, but you want to be, you're attached to the people, not the things. And so when we suffer, it's because we are attached to the things in life that we are trying to cling to with the idea that, that things do not change. What do I mean by that? And I'll use COVID as a perfect example. Prior to COVID, I was doing executive coaching in three different businesses. I was teaching yoga and I was building an online coaching business. March 15th, I had a full teacher training sold out, 15 students. I was going to make $60,000. I had five speaking gigs lined up. I was going to make another $30,000. I had three contracts signed for corporate wellness where I was going to go in and teach yoga and meditation and mindfulness. That was another $30,000. And I had teaching gigs. On March 15th, I was making $250,000 a year. On March 16th, I made $0. One day, gone. Refunding $150,000 to people. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, I can cling to the idea that I am an executive coach and I am a sought-after yoga teacher and I can cling to these beliefs and I can suffer. Or... I can let go of the things I do and ask myself, what is my true purpose? What is my nature? And if I go down to the deep part of my core, my nature is to help people. That's what I do. Okay. So if I let go of what I'm doing and understand who I am, then I'm no longer attached to what I do. And I can figure out how to pivot to different circumstances to then change, to move forward. Hence building the online coaching business because then, and then, because that's a, another way for me to help. Now, if, if eventually that goes away and no people no longer want to do online coaching, I can let go of it because it doesn't define who I am. What defines who I am is helping people, not being a life coach. Right. So it's your purpose, not your title. It's what, it's what it, I'm not attached to that even, I'm not even attached to that. If one day I will no longer be a viable life coach because I will be out of touch with the world. That's the day it's, you kill yourself. Okay. No, it's the day I adapt. <laughs> I, that was my on. first I, joke, my first joke in the conversation, Michael. I, I, it's, it's this idea that we cling to these, the, to permanence because it goes back to this original philosophy the truth in this world is we all are going to die. That, I mean, it's not death and taxes. We are, because you don't have, if you don't pay taxes, there are consequences, but you don't have to pay taxes. You, it's only you all death. suffer. Mm -hmm. Death is the only thing that we're going to experience. So if we're going to die, that means everything around us is going to die, which means one day the car you drive, the house you live in, the property that you own, the partner you have will no longer be there. So if we understand that, then we can, that everything in this world is not permanent. Totally then we permanent. can, and we can let go of the attachment to it. Then we can then shift our mind to understand that, that the things that we have in this world are gifts given to us. Mm. And that those gifts given to us are presents that we can take that are given to us to look, look after as stewards, but that if they are taken away from us, they're not ours in the first place. Mm -hmm. So then we no longer have to worry about it. And that's how non-attachment allows us to live our best lives. So that if we have a nice house, we can look and go, wow, this house is a gift given to us. I don't own it. Yes, theoretically in America, I own the property, but a storm can come by and blow up and knock down my house. The economy everything, can change and I can lose everything, it. Everything can be taken from us 
except our attitude and our integrity, which leads me to my next question. How does a person live life with integrity? It's so easy. I mean, it's so easy these days to like have this idea of pretending that you're something that you're not. I mean, especially I see this, social media. Oh my God. Social media is in my, in coaching. I see it all the time in the coaching industry. I know so many life coaches out there that they have such a false persona of who they are. Like they, they pretend to be this big time life coach that they're driving a Porsche and living in this big house that is this staged photography or they're living some sort of blissful, perfect life with their husband that they are living this magical life. And we, you want to live by integrity. You want to own both your flaws and your dark while at the same time striving to live within the light or the good that is who you are. We lose that integrity is when we ignore the dark. We ignore the flaws in our life. We ignore the vulnerability. And so when we're trying to build a coaching business or, and I don't even can speak for coaching specifically because that's what I know. Instead of trying to have this idea that we know all the answers, that we're living this great American life, that if you just listen to me and I'll solve all your problems. Instead, we acknowledge that we are just trying to do the best that we can. Then we no longer have to worry about trying to cut corners, that we no longer have to pretend to be something that we're not. And so that we can build our businesses and our lives by being honest of who we are. Authentic. Great stuff. Let's Authentic. Take, let's take a moment to hear from our sponsor. We'll come right back with this fantastic conversation we're having with Michael Cohen. This episode of Self-Help Coaching is brought to you by Perficio. Benjamin Franklin taught that leisure is the time for doing something useful and that this leisure the diligent person will obtain, but the lazy one never Visit www.perficio.io, that's P-E-R-F-I-C-I-O dot I-O, where you can transform your idea of leisure to make it actually add to your life. You're listening to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast with me, your host, Tony Petroza. Unfortunately, this is the final segment with the fantastic coach, Michael Cohen. So I'm going to talk about a very important question, really a, a pervasive situation in personal development self-help is and that is what why are change and personal growth difficult and why do most people fail in achieving their dreams and goals all right so <laughs> i don't have enough time to answer that but i'll give i'll also i'll give the, at least the foundation to it That'll and i'll so use i'll put i'll put me into the story so as i was alluding to earlier in my life when i was in my beginning of my 30s I was kind of not in the best place mentally on paper I looked fantastic I had a I was living in New York City I had a great apartment overlooking a park I had I had a 1100 square foot pre-war apartment with 13 foot ceilings I was making $150,000 a year and I was 30 years old and I looked like it was great but inside, I was very angry. I met my first wife when I was 23. We got together. We were together until I was 29. I missed my 20s. When everybody was going out and partying and dating, I was in a committed relationship. And I thought that was going to be my life. And we got married and divorced within six months. And we probably should have ended the relationship years earlier, but we did it. And so I found myself at 30 years old, making a ton of money alone, not knowing how to function as a single adult male, because I didn't go through that learning curve. I went from being a single man in college to 30. And yeah. so I sort of kind of lost it. I, I did a lot of drugs. I partied a lot. I slept with a bunch of women and I was this angry, toxic person. 
And I was very overweight. I was eating horribly. And I just did not like the person that I was looking at in the mirror. I didn't. Li- I don't like him either. Okay, <laughs> go on. Yeah, I was. I was angry all the time. I was. I was rude to people, and I was very materialistic because that's what I thought I was supposed to be. And I started to work on myself. I started going to meditation classes and yoga. I started. St- I started going to church and synagogue, just looking for answers. And it was really hard until one day I heard this message. And the message was really this. This is what changed the course of my life. You're not happy. And I was like, yes, Michael, I'm not happy. So if you're not happy, what's the problem? Well, every time I try to make changes to my life, it's really hard. And I'm not happy because I got to like stay in and my friends are ragging on me and my family doesn't really understand what I'm going through. And I got to pay down this debt. This kind of sucks. And I just, it's hard. I'm not happy if I make change, making changes to my life. I'm not happy. I don't want to do either. If you're not happy now and change is hard and not, you're not going to be happy during the process. What's the difference? There is none. So you might as well try and change and over time if you don't give up if you're lucky one day you'll get to a place where you find that true purpose what happens along that journey though why it's so hard is as we continue to change and grow for example losing weight or paying down our credit card debt or dealing with marital problems even if we begin to change our behavior If we've been putting energy into that toxic period of life for five, 10 years, if we stop putting energy into it, is it all of a sudden going to go away? No, we still got to deal with the problems. And so we give up because we make these changes and we still have to deal with the consequences of the 10 previous toxic years of our lives. We are unwilling to allow that period of change to be painful and sad and lonely and hard. We don't want it. We want to avoid pain and seek pleasure. And so we're unhappy now and we're trying to avoid pain and seek pleasure. And change is about really embracing the pain of life because change requires pain because what is at the root of change death. And so we have to kill off those negative habits, relationships, kill off the debt, the toxicity, and that's hard. And so we give up rather too quickly because we say to ourselves, well, I've been trying to lose weight for six months, or I've been trying to pay off my credit card debt for six months. But every time I try to get, I get to a point where like I've gotten the credit card debt off, something happens and I'm back in the hole again. But it's only been six months or three years. And that's not, that's been too long. So I give up instead of allowing that course to happen. And it might take your entire life, which is the other part. Sometimes change takes an entire life to get there. Sometimes change is never ends. And we are constantly having to fight through it. And that's why it's so hard. That's my interpretation. It's basically what we've got to do with self-help, personal development. We have to replace our, our bad habits with good ones. And it takes as long as it takes. If you can do it in a year, you're, the, you're awesome. If, you, if it takes you 50, that's how long it takes. <laughs> you just got to keep with it because it, it, the habits don't get created uh, in the time that we'd like. They, get, they take as long as it takes. Because if we did them, if we did it every every day, then it'd probably be done, be created very quickly. But you know, very few people are that good to do it every day to replace a, a bad habit with a good habit. No one wants to wait. Everybody wants like everybody wants the overnight success. Everybody right. wants everybody wants that victory immediately, and we just are unwilling to be patient. Right. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll sum it up with this and some, some sort of adaptation of something I read long ago is that a patient man or woman can have anything. And the inverse of that, of course, is an impatient man or woman can have nothing. 
So be the patient person. Michael, you have been an awesome guest. Thanks. Great stuff. I really appreciate it. Uh, how can people get a hold of you? How can they find you? How can they check out your stuff? The best and easiest way to just find me is to go to my website, The Elevate Life Project. I have a free quiz where they can take to understand their purpose by just going to elevatelifeproject.com backslash purpose. If they take the quiz, they'll get a free ebook on what I teach in my coaching courses on how to find true purpose and understand the difference between purpose and passion. And all this other great information is on my website, my coaching videos, my coaching blog, my short little podcast. That's where you can find me. Great stuff. And we'll have, we'll, on your profile on, on, on a website, we'll have all our, your social media links put up there. Of course, they can find them at your website too. Michael, you got any final remarks to the audience? Well, besides apologizing for my one cat who just seems to be talking no, in this whole show. I, I, I don't do even apologize. hear it. I don't even hear it. You know, my final advice on this show today is simply to put, just don't give up. If you have a, if you, whatever you need to solve in life, whatever vision, whatever, like whatever you want in life, as long as it's reasonable, right? You're going to get it, right? If you have the dream of getting a yacht, you may or may not get there. But if you have a dream of living a good life with a nice car and a decent house, you'll get that. Just yeah. don't give up. Maybe just get a smaller boat. Great stuff, yeah. Michael. I really appreciate it. Uh, excellent, excellent conversation. And remember, everyone, we're all responsible for ourselves and we could all use a little help. With that, thank you very much, Michael Cohen. Great conversation. We'll see you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the Self-Help Coaching Podcast, where insights, attitudes, and methods for success get illuminated. Learn what leaders and change workers have done and are doing now to create magnificent futures. Remember to visit our website at self-helpcoaching.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Self-Help Coaching Podcast.